Come on, let's hear it for Mr. Christopher Fultz is in the house. Come on down. Thank you. All right, guys. So first of all, I'm going to give you a disclaimer. I sweat. So anybody that knows me will realize I'll be very wet afterwards, but I'm in this weight loss program right now, so we'll see how that works out. To be quite honest, it's a colon cleanse. I'm not sure if anybody's ever done a colon cleanse in their life, but it is the worst tasting thing on earth, right? If anybody's ever tried it, I don't recommend it, but in the end result works out, I'm going to be okay. So uh, I'm here to give you guys a dose of reality. Um, you know, you guys have had the opportunity to talk to a lot of my co uh, colleagues over the last couple days. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit different than the rest of them uh, because I'm here to tell you kind of what happened to me and how I was able to turn that into something thing that affects all of you guys. Now I see some people, I'm just going to draw attention to a few people. One of my colleagues, Dr. Wolf, he's part of my social enterprise think tank, he's here. Um, Nellie Vasquez Roland, right over there. Uh, this lady, I could tell you right now, changed my life. Um, and you're going to hear me talk a lot about her foundation, a safe haven today. All the cool pictures that were up there from like runs and stuff, that's from her event that's coming up this month on the 14th. Um, it is the largest run in America uh, to stop homelessness. Okay, so that's an amazing thing happens right here in Chicago, not in the hoity-toity on the lakefront, but in Douglas Park, where we have one of the worst homeless rates in America. So that's how we get things done. But I'm going to tell you why I care so much about this stuff. So first and foremost, um, I started my career in politics. Who here has ever worked in politics? Anybody? Yeah. All right. Anybody worked in Republican Party politics? That's <laughs> right. One's enough, let me tell you. So I started when I was 14, and I don't care who you are. When you start in politics when you're 14, you get a jaded perception of reality. More importantly, if you start in Republican Party politics, you get a jaded perception of everything. Um, and when you're 14, my uncle was a big lobbyist, the Brady Bill, uh, concealed carry, all that kind of stuff that we're upset about. Um, I, I was part of, I guess, genetically back in the day. So basically, uh, but 14. Um, I started volunteering. 16, I got a job in Congress. 18, Elizabeth Dole for president. Remember her, American Red Cross president. And then uh, a gentleman by the name of Ari Fleischer, um, who actually ran Elizabeth Dole's campaign, decided, you know what, the campaign's over. Jumped over to George W. Bush. I went over there as well. So between 19 and 25, every political race that we're all pissed off about in America now, I was part of back then. So the governor of California, the governor of Mississippi, most of the people that are in prison, I don't even know which way to say this, but that's the truth of the matter. Um, you know, and one of the greatest things, uh, ultimately, um, somehow I managed to get myself all the way up to the National Board of the College Republicans. Now, <clears throat> I don't even know what to say about the college Republicans. But for those of you guys that went to college, you know which one of the people in the school were in the college Republicans. So I was like the poster boy for the Republican Party. Now, I've never been a conservative, but I definitely knew a lot about politics. Speak slow. I'm supposed to speak slower. You listen faster. <laughs> okay, I'm just joking. Uh, one of the, the greatest things that people remember about me in politics is I thought it would be a good idea to dye my hair blonde on the top, frosted tips or whatever. So uh, if you notice me, that's Newt Gingrich um, uh, right there, Chris Foltz with the blonde tips. Um, you know, it's pretty embarrassing. Uh, that's Ed Rendell. He's the governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, he was the mayor of Philadelphia back then. Um, you know, again with the blonde hair. Tom Brokaw and the blonde hair. Um, so no matter which way you look at it, I literally got myself involved with politics in a, in a pretty remarkable way. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I ended up here, in jail. This is actually the tier in Winnebago County Jail uh, where I spent 119 days. And I'm going to tell you how I ended up there. Um, when I got done winning the Bush uh, campaign the second time around, uh, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. We, we know what it's like to have family members with cancer. It's horrible. But I moved back home to Rockford, Illinois, into her basement. And uh, I remember like it was yesterday, I had my wisdom teeth pulled out in the first week. Now, there's a dentist right here in the front. We know that doesn't hurt. Okay, let's be honest. But they give you two months worth of Vicodin. Now, <laughs> that, that, that definitely doesn't hurt. So I just happened to do the two months worth of Vicodin in about two weeks. So there's two things that happen here. Either you die or you become addicted. Now, both of which are the boulevard of broken dreams. I promise you that. Uh, but I became addicted. So literally, for the next uh, uh, nine months, I'm literally in my mother's basement. My parents are both in law enforcement. So you know it's pretty awkward when you're down in the basement. Uh, and I graduated to snorting heroin, $300 a day. OK, right? I don't care if you're Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. You can't afford $300 a day of heroin. You will die, OK? I promise you, anybody in this room did $10 of heroin, they would die. That's just how powerful the drug is nowadays. Um, but regardless of the situation, um, the only thing that stopped me was my mother died. Okay, and the day after her funeral, I'm at the funeral home making the final arrangements, and six police cars pull up. And, uh, you know, the judge who I helped get elected when I was younger said literally the words, we are not putting up with this bullshit anymore. And they put a quarter million dollar warrant for me to go to jail, and to go to jail rehab. Now, 
I don't even know what to tell you guys about jail. You learn interesting things. I promise you this, though. If you go to jail as a Republican, you leave as a Democrat. That's a given. Um, <laughs> but that's, a, that's just a fact. And there's a million reasons why that one happens. But the, the, biggest, the biggest thing, uh, it wasn't so much what was happening inside jail, but on the outside, you know, I'm not paying my mother's bills, nothing. My, house, my mother's home was foreclosed upon, along with everything I owned in my entire life literally thrown into dumpsters in the front yard. Now, I mean, there's a lot of people that says, oh, I have nothing, this, that, and the other. I had nothing. It's not that my TV was too small for modern-day standards. I had nothing. I had the winter outfit that I wore into jail in January, and I had that same winter outfit when I got out in May. Now, my dad picks me up at jail. My parents were divorced when I was 18 months old. And uh, I could, you grow a goatee in jail, okay? It's just one of the cool things you do. And I remember before I left the police station, my dad made me shave the goatee in the bathroom. And, uh, and basically, he said, he said, son, listen, I can't have you come live with me. So the court ordered me to live in something called an Oxford house. It's like an independent, independent living house in Waukegan is where I was, uh, court ordered. My dad gave me 500 bucks, and I, want to, I went to Walmart and literally bought a new life. You can do that at Walmart. Okay, I promise you, at Walmart, 500 bucks is like a million dollars anywhere else. Um, I had exactly $182 left, and ironically, the one week's worth of rent at this new independent living halfway house, fraternity house with all these rules, um, was 180 bucks. So that was that. That was my one week, and that is all I had on this earth. And my dad said to me, he said, son, he said, just make me one promise. You're not going to get involved with politics. So immediately, get involved with politics. You know, when your parents say, don't touch the hot stove, and you literally run at it, that's what I did. So the Republicans were like, no. Okay, drugs, jail, all that. They didn't care what my resume was. George W. Bush twice. They're even pissed about that one. And, um, and, and, but the Democrats were like, this guy's our hero. So the Democrats, arms wide open. I volunteered for uh, Eddie Washington in Waukegan. Uh, it was my first experience in Democrat politics. Now, for the first year, everybody thought I was an implant from the Republican Party. Now, like, like they wouldn't even let me volunteer. How could you not volunteer? How did they, I didn't know there was a rule to that, but I was prevented from volunteering. So everybody that said I couldn't do it, then I just went above them, and then above them, and I moved myself all the way up to the Young Democrats of America. So you really can't tell one of the people in charge of the Young Democrats of America they can't volunteer in your congressional district. I promise you that. So one thing I realized, very simply, is that we spend all of our time in America celebrating victories. Okay, it's easy to celebrate victories. How many dental whitening pens you sell, or how much money you raise for the run on homelessness, or how many people's businesses you've changed. But life is 100% about reacting to failures. That is it. Okay, the only difference I'm up here on the stage talking to you guys versus the other way around is I probably reacted to my failures a little bit differently than some of you guys have. Now I can say this, there's nobody in this room that has not experienced failure, okay? But I can also say this, failure is okay. It is okay, okay? Realize failure is okay. Once you realize failure is okay, you're going to get a lot farther in life. Because realize this, when you fail at something, you have the opportunity to prepare yourself to never fail at it again. That's a fact. So if you ever live a life where you're not hitting failures weekly, daily, for me, momentarily, every minute, um, you're not doing something right. So I'm going to tell you about what I do. So originally, I decided well, I'm going to start a marketing and public relations firm. And I started this campaign when I was a waiter at one of the restaurants, because the only job I could get that paid was being a waiter. Now, imagine if I'm serving you dinner rolls, and I'm trying to tell you how I know five U.S. presidents. You're going to think I'm on drugs right then. No question. So I was fired from every single waiter job because I talked too much to the clients. Now, I had the, uh, the restaurant clients, right, the, the, the customers. I had the number one sales, most wine up sales. Ironically, in the drug recovery world, they allowed me to be a bartender. Doesn't make any sense. Can't be at home past 11 p.m., I promise you that. But I can go out there and toss drinks all day long. Um, so it was really kind of an awkward experience. But then, when it boiled down to it, I realized what I really wanted to do. So I started my first marketing firm in Waukegan from one of the restaurants that I got fired from. They said, Chris, you got a big mouth. And I said, all my family will agree with you on that one. And they said, I bet you can get 100 people to our event. So I said, yes, I would do it. They paid me. I got 372 people there. So that was a victory. So then I figured I could probably do this at a lot of bars and restaurants and get a lot of people to events. That wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do, but I got about 20 clients doing it in the North Shore of Chicago. If anybody here lives in the North Shore, you know what it's like over there. Um, you know, one person puts a pink flamingo in their yard. By the next morning, everybody has a pink flamingo. So I was the pink flamingo for a while in the North Shore. Um, and, and then what happened is I, I did it with a girlfriend of mine. Now, has anybody ever been in a business with their significant other? All right, right, Lord have mercy. Have you ever broken up with a significant other and stayed in a successful business with them? Anybody? 
Yeah, I tried, I failed. Um, and the truth of the matter is I kept one client and gave her all the rest. And I started my current firm in a child's bedroom in Evanston, Illinois, about three and a half years ago. And you know, people said to me, they're like, Chris, you're crazy. I said, we're gonna move downtown Chicago in a year. I was wrong, it was a year and two days. We moved downtown Chicago. Then I said, we were going to take over the fifth floor in a year, I was wrong, it was six months. We took over the third floor. So every single thing that I did was, was, was moving me in the right direction in PR and marketing. But can somebody in the room define what public relations is to me? I mean, just somebody. What you got, Sweezy? <laughs> this guy heard my speech in New York a couple weeks ago, so thank you, Major Mike Sweezy. But anyways, give him a hand for being a military veteran that gives a damn, right? All right, thank you, Mike. Um, yes, yeah, so many people get caught up in public relations, and it's become PR, right? What is PR? Like KFC? It used to be Kentucky Fried Chicken, now it's just KFC. What is that? Nobody knows. But public relations is about one thing, and that's relating to the public. And somewhere along the way, we forgot about this. You see, I'm not in the business of making people look better. Anybody can do that. I'm in the business of making people better. Big difference, okay? If you make people better, if you make brands better, if you make charities better, you make products better, the world becomes better. That's just it. So what I do right now is I partner with brands, thought leaders, centers of influence for one reason only. And that's very simple to me, to change the world. I'm not interested in anything else. Yes. I'm not interested in one damn thing besides that, right? Now, <clears throat> my good friend and colleague, Nellie Vasquez Rowan over here, tells me that change is a scary word. And I would agree with you, it is a scary word. But <clears throat> nowadays, with religion, you can't say we want people to evolve, because then we get the Darwinists getting mad. We can't really say any words nowadays without somebody getting mad. But the truth of the matter is, change is a scary thing. But once we realize that it's all for the right reasons, we're going to get far in life. So. What I had to do is I had to realize what was going to be my mission. So here I've got this marketing firm, I've got this PR firm, and a gentleman asked me a question. He said, and this is about a year ago, he said, Chris, what do you know about collaborative capitalism? Now, does anybody know who says, talks about collaborative capitalism all the time? Anybody? I'll give you an update. All right. This gentleman, Bernie Dorman, friend of mine. We all love him. We all adore him. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I had no idea what he was talking about. What he said to me was, we live in a world of competitive capitalism. It's all cutthroat. We all do things against each other. And he said collaborative capitalism is the idea of being able to work with each other to get things done. Now, there's a lot of weird theories out there. And Bernie's not necessarily the normalest guy on earth. I'm not even sure if that's a word, but he's not. We all love him, but he's crazy sometimes. But he's crazy for a good reason. So I spent literally almost a year trying to figure out what is collaborative capitalism and words as it exist. So I traveled all over the country. I tried to figure out anything. And then I came to one conclusion. How do I do it? I develop and create social enterprise. Does anybody know what social enterprise is? Anybody? You nod your head. What is it, bro? Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a good general framework of what social enterprise is. I'll put it very simply put. Uh, social enterprise is the idea of having a brand or business that transparently thinks that on the forefront of what they do is something mission oriented. When I say transparent, it is the main objective of the brand. Now, I'm going to give you guys a couple case studies of what I mean by this and how literally we've changed the world. Now, let me put it in perspective. Less than 10 years ago, I was in jail. Right? I told you guys that. Yesterday I had my first meeting with Klaus Nobel. You may not know him, but you know his family, the Nobel Prize family. And we're figuring out how we're going to fix education in the world. This morning I had a mayor with, uh, meeting with the Secretary of State of Illinois. And we're fixing health care in the state of Illinois. This afternoon I had a meeting with the mayor's office and every chief in the police department to figure out how we make our city streets safer. Because that's what we have the opportunity and that's what we're required to do as business owners in America right now. See, it's not just about the almighty dollar. Yes, it's awesome to uh, fly on private jets. But to me, the only time you should be on a private jet is when you're carrying a big ass uh, shipment of food, clothes, and laptop computers to Malawi, Africa, because they don't have any of it. That's when you ride on a private, private jet. And if anybody wants to argue with me on that, bring them in the room right now. So when we talk about this, I'm going to tell you what are the four basic things that I think make your brand something significant. Very simple. And if you follow these four steps and establish it in this way, you will get things done. Now, I don't sell anything. I have no special offers, nothing of that nature. But what I have is some wisdom. And the first thing that I want to tell you guys about is concept. What is concept? Okay, I guarantee you, everybody in this room has 50 to 60 concepts that they're talking about every single day. Whether you come up with an idea, uh, a little trinket, some people sell clothing, whatever it may be, but it's the idea that you want to pitch to society. That's your concept, very, very simply put. But a concept means absolutely nothing without an offer, okay? Now, there's a lot of people, I think the biggest sand uh, trap in America right now it's people with tons of concepts, but no offers. Offers what you're selling. Now, selling doesn't always mean you're going to get paid money, okay? It could be simply inviting somebody to an event that's free. 
That's an offer, okay? And once you guys realize that offers exist, everything is the way that we're going to get a lot farther in our own businesses. Once you have a concept and an offer, you need relationships. How many people in this room have a million dollar marketing budget? All right then. So you have no way to compete against people with million dollar marketing budgets unless you have relationships. Relationships can be the media, they can be friends, they can be colleagues, but without them, you're spending the big bucks to compete. And I can tell you right now, there's a lot of big boys out there that are going to beat you at this game. And once you have relationships in line, that's and only then is when you seek exposure. Exposure is press, PR. I'm sick and tired of people. I was reading online uh, some PR firm in Chicago, and they define public relations as the act of hiring a publicist to get your message to the media. Now, if public relations was the act of hiring a publicist, we're in big trouble here in America, right? Like, is ordering food at McDonald's the act of feeding yourself healthy? No, it's not. It doesn't work like that. So what we really need to realize is that we do things a little bit wrong wrong in business. We try to spend so much time doing pay to play, but quite frankly, everybody else has a bigger budget. So I'm going to talk to you guys just a little bit about some of the things that we've done recently. And then I'm going to show you really what social enterprise is. So how many people in here work in healthcare or wellness or anything of that nature? Okay, a lot of people in the room. I see some doctors in the room, a lot of them I'm colleagues with, but we have a huge problem in America. Okay, there's a lot of people that are uninsured. Okay, there's no question. I guarantee a lot of people in this room are uninsured. Why? Because we're entrepreneurs. It sucks, but that's just how it works. But a doctor came to me. He owned a very, very successful surgical center here in Chicago. And he said, Chris, first thing he hired me for is to get him more business, right? And unfortunately, in medicine, when you have more business, something's going wrong, unless you're in preventative health care. And he said, but Chris, this is what I also want to do at the same time. This might make it a little bit difficult for you, but I want to stop accepting insurance. And I want to sue Blue Cross and Blue Shield for being, being, uh, having disparity with the way that they actually reimburse. Do you know, if you have a surgery that costs five grand, and you're out of network, and your insurance doesn't cover it, they'll send you a check in the mail for two grand, and then you won't have the rest of the money to pay for your surgery. And most of the people cash those checks, use them for vacation, use them for whatever happens, and the healthcare system just gets worse. So he said, Chris, I want to stop charging people for surgery. I want to stop taking insurance. I want to sue Blue Cross Blue Shield. And the basketball team that I own, Chris, actually plays in Blue Cross Blue Shield Arena. So we're going to probably have to work out that one as well. So I said, listen, I like anything controversial. So I got involved with this one right away. So it was a Monday. I remember it like it was yesterday. We sat down and we looked at the amount of uninsured people and children, nonetheless, in America. And the numbers were baffling. And the crazy thing about it is we have state agencies that pay for this, and it's still not enough. So he said to me, he's like, Chris, how do we go epic with this? So we came up with this name, Project Hugs, helping uninsured get surgery. Now, mind you, this is a Monday. We came up with the name. Tuesday, we created this logo right here. On Wednesday, we created a website. On Thursday, we filled it with board members. On Friday, I got them invited to the Clinton Global Initiative, and I promise you on Tuesday of the following week that a $10 million commitment from the Clinton Global Initiative, right? Now, I promise you right now, guys, you can walk into this surgical center in Chicago on Harlem Avenue, and if you don't have insurance, they treat you the same way as if you had a billion dollars in your pocket. And that's what America's all about, right? All right, and then just a little update on this. We were refunded $15 million, Clinton Global Initiative. We just, we just bought the house next door to the surgical center. Why? Because sometimes people need to recover, and sometimes it's easy with your family there. Okay? So now we're going to be flying people in from all over the country. Don't care about your race. Don't care about how much money you have. Don't give a damn about your credit. And don't care where you've been. We care about where you're going, and we're going to get you there. That's social enterprise. You guys understand? So then, it's okay. You know what? Clap when I actually solve the problem in America. But this is a start, right? So I'm going to tell you just a little bit more. Here's, here's the Tom Cruise, obviously, right here. Um, and this is our lovely first lady. And this is the doctor I was referencing right there. Uh, you know, our, our governor, or pardon, our president right now, I believe he's in Tanzania today. Um, you know, so it's amazing to see what stuff we're able to accomplish in America and how the world's paying attention. And this is one of them. I'm honored to say whenever the Clintons are in town or the Obamas, I serve as one of the hosts. Um, I'm on Barack Obama's Gen 44 National Finance Committee, which is everybody under the age of 40. Again, I was in jail less than 10 years ago. No excuses in this room, OK? Next thing, anybody know who Shea Vaughn is? Vince Vaughn's mom. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Dr. Wolf's actually a product of her healthy initiative program I'm about to talk, of, uh, talk to you guys about. But Shea Vaughn came to me. Now, she's like a hip, cool aunt. I can't say grandma because she would kill me. But she's a hip, cool aunt. And she, kept, she said, Chris, this is, this is honestly the, the Shea Vaughn path. She was a personal trainer. She came to Bill Walsh's program and decided that she wanted to build a scalable model called Shaynetics. Shaynetics was going to be a new way for people to go through health and wellness. Yoga, Pilates, basically anything cool mixed into one pot with a hip 
senior lady helping you out with it. And uh, she said to me, she's like, Chris, this is just not satisfying enough. I I'm not really getting anything done. And I said, well, what do you want to do, Shay? She said, I want to actually make it possible for kids at public schools to have healthy food. Now, the problem with kids and healthy, uh, healthy food in the schools is it's not so much what we give them in school. That's easy, all right? But when they go home and they don't have that, it's pointless. And the, the biggest problem is, is how do you have sustainable programs like that in the public schools when even the parents aren't educated? Do you know that 45% of African American women in America are ineligible for organ transplants because their BMI is all above a national average? So that means that even if we got the kids healthy, they don't have that support at home because it's just not available. So we said, we're not putting up with that anymore at all. So this is Shavon. That is me in a fox costume, and that is a whip in her hand at the Laugh Factory as she's spanking me in the butt while we're raising money for kids in public schools. Now, I'll take it, uh, a whip in the butt in a fox costume for kids that don't have food. I promise you that. All right? So after I get a lot of crap for that one, we came up with something called the Healthy Initiative, and we started here in Chicago. And we started with 40 people that were adults that made a commitment towards actually making their health and wellness better. These people got free training sessions, they got free year-long gym memberships, new clothes, personal gym training equipment at home, smoothie machines, all the organic food, this, that, and the other. And we got it all for free. So why did we want to do this? Well, because ultimately we wanted to prove that our model worked with the adults because then it removes the excuse of my family not being supportive at home when I eat healthy food at schools. So then we actually had to pay for that healthy food at schools. That's, I guess, would be the challenge. The government can't figure it out. So we, private citizens, figured it out ourselves. Matter of fact, she's from Toronto, for crying out loud. She's not even born here and she's figuring out our problems. So this guy right here, Dr. Joel Furman, anybody know who he is? Yeah. World renowned, right? We flew him in from New York and we had our first event. Now, this is the first event we ever did as an organization together, and we're like, are we going to get anybody there? That was a big challenge of ours. We're charging $150 plus a ticket to get people there to raise money for kids that don't have food. Wow, well over 1,000 people at our first event at Germania Place. And this is the thing. Right here, really, really small in the back of the room is Bill Walsh. Now, I promise you this. If you're Bill Walsh and you're in the back of the room and you look that small, we did something right. Okay? We did something right. All right? Because that guy knows what he's doing to be in the front of the room. And we managed to do it. We called it Celebrate Yourself Healthy. I'm honored to say that this is rolling out in pilot studies with aldermen and aldermanic boards in the city of Chicago. And I'm sick and tired of everything going into the north side, into all the Ivy prep schools, this, that, and the other. So I'm putting it in the west side. That's where, and this, well, evidently we're going to scale to the south side too. All right, I got some voters over there in the corner, so I can't mess this one up. All right. So let me tell you about something else. Monica, where's she at? This is one of my favorite people on earth right here, Monica. Now, if you guys that don't know Monica, you're going to know her after this. This sweetheart came to me in the office. She saw me speak somewhere, and she said, she, she, she speaks fairly broken English at times. So she comes into my office, this is what she says. She said, Chris, I sell shoes, okay? Uh, this is Monica right here. She says, I sell shoes. This is my company, Style Up Girl. And I want to make something called a happy box. So right then and there, man, she had my attention. I could only imagine what this girl was trying to say. So I sat there and listened. She was explaining to me how shoes get mailed in a box, and there's another box, and we want to do something with the other box. I didn't know if it was a cycling thing. I didn't know what was going on. So right away, I found out that it was about giving back. So I said, let's drop the happy box name. Let's call it a give back box. So it at least I understand what it is because I'm in the same room as you. That would be the first step. So she said, this is the challenge that we face. She ships her shoes in a box. The outside box that you ship it in goes to somebody's home. We all know how this goes. We fold it up. We don't do anything with it. It goes to the basement until we move. We set it on fire if you're from the hillbilly type of family that I am. Whatever it may be. But she said, there's got to be a better use for this. And we found a better use for it. So we came up with this concept called Give Back Box. So right now what happens is when you send this box out and you buy a pair of shoes from Monica's store, they give you a pre-addressed label on the inside, all paid for, and then a little note that says, fill this box with stuff for kids that have nothing. Fill this box for homes that have no food. Fill this box with rice, money, toys, clothing, doesn't matter. Your mailman will pick it up and it'll bring it right to the place that needs it the most. And we're like, this is a great concept. We have to figure out how to do it. Is anybody gonna pay attention to us? Is anybody literally going to pay attention? There's a lot of people that are doing great things. Well, I can promise you right now, 
We did our first trial run, and this is the first boxes that came back. This is in my office in Chicago, and on here there's a little give back box logo and one of the largest set of smiles I've ever seen in my life, because this is what you call proof of concept. Okay, we got boxes in the mail, and these boxes were full of good stuff. I was trying to figure out how I can get stuff sent to me in the mail like this, <laughs> but I think that's probably violating some sort of rule. So she said, you know what? We can make it bigger. So here's a for-profit business that has a non-profit idea to give back to the world. Now, how do we fund all this? Because in, in the economy nowadays, it's hard enough to get a damn sale. We all know this, and no matter what you do. So then she spent her own money traveling the country to figure out who was going to take on the idea of give back box. So then we started having meetings, Karma Loop. I don't know if you guys know who this, probably the coolest website for hip urban clothes. These are the guys that made the biggest impact in the Boston Marathon. They're a Boston based company. When that marathon explosion happened, they were right there to help it. And then a slightly smaller company reached out to us and they said, you know what? We would love to do this too. We've got big boxes, and tons of stuff can fit in these big boxes. And then we started getting more calls. Newegg, anybody ever bought anything from Newegg? I bought all my first nerdy stuff from this website. Newegg, my first flash drive, when they were like $200 and it was 12 megabytes. Um, so they're like, we're gonna do this too. We just got off the phone with them last week. And then the smallest retail outlet in America called us. And they're like, listen, we think we can do this too. So I'm happy to say that in less than 30 days, we have 150,000 boxes going out a month. Wow. That's social enterprise. I don't care which, you can change a community with that kind of stuff. And you know what the greatest thing is? That was just one of those four that I showed you, that 150,000 number. So you can only imagine Amazon's got millions and millions of things going out a month, and I'll be happy when millions and millions of things come back to where they belong. So right now we partner with, with uh, Goodwill. All of them get sent down to Goodwill. They disperse it. And the greatest thing about it is we're not just throwing clothes on the street. We're putting them into stores that are, that are actually putting money back into the system. People can actually come buy their clothes or get them donated. But some of the people that get employed by Goodwill stores are the ones that were homeless just a few months prior. Okay, That's how you get things done in America. One of the biggest challenges we face in America is our housing crisis, right? There's no question about it. Do, you know, and, and there's so many different organizations that deal with this. I bet a lot of you guys don't realize that 30% of homeless people are veterans. How crazy. Did you know that, Major Sweezy? How embarrassing is that 82% of those guys become drug and alcohol addicts just by virtue of being on the street? It's hard. You know, the definition of homeless is when you don't have permanent housing. There's a lot, there are people in this room that are homeless. You just don't realize it. All right? I promise you, you don't realize it. You know, my girlfriend doesn't technically pay rent. We live together. I'm not sure if she qualifies as homeless, but she definitely doesn't. She's not here tonight, so I can say that stuff, but I love her. She'll see the video, and I do love you. Okay? Um, so, a guy, now, I have a very interesting relationship with this guy named Rich Killian. Anybody ever met Rich Killian? Okay, so Rich Killian is a phenomenal guy. He's like, a, we're in the same fraternity, he's big, strong, played for the White Sox for one day or whatever, so that was his claim to fame. But he started a real estate franchise when everybody thought that it would be impossible. There's only 24 real estate franchises on Earth. Century 21's the largest. There's tons of real estate houses in Chicago, but real estate franchises, there's not that many of them. Now, he hired me originally to help make his brand grow. Now, for me, when people hire me because they want more revenues, I just don't give a damn. I'll be honest with you. You get revenues as the result of doing good things. That's how the world works, okay? And it's hard for people to realize this, but once you do, I promise you that's when all the glory comes. I promise you that. So he came to me and he says, you know what, Chris? I look like a US Senator already, especially when you put this backdrop behind me. Um, I own all these companies, like 20, 30 companies, and I do things to give back to people. The Richard Killian Bookstore at Roosevelt University, Bill Walsh's son goes there. Uh, so I'm like, okay, this is good. This sounds fairly cliche. Okay, what do you got that's real? Well, Chris, I started this nonprofit two years ago and I have done absolutely zero things with it. I call it the Hardship Home Foundation. So I was doing all this work for a for profit company, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, why isn't he having me do something for this nonprofit? Why doesn't he allow me to teach him how his brand can grow by doing good things? So we literally had an up and down relationship to the point we hated each other. I remember I called him one day screaming, I got something in my attorney call you, but just all this, you know how it goes with guys. And then one day he called me and said, you know what, Chris, I want you to be the executive director of my foundation out of clear blue sky. And I said, this is amazing, Rich. Tell me about it. So we sat there and we looked at what happens in the housing world right now. Anybody here in real estate or mortgages for that matter? Okay, so toxic assets. 
Those are homes that are foreclosed upon that the bank owns, right? Did you know that at least in the state of Illinois, if a bank has a million dollars of toxic assets, they have to keep three million dollars of cash collateral on the books, a three to one ratio? That three million dollars is supposed to go to you guys for your mortgages and your small business association loans. Out the door. Because somebody in the banking system messed up the economy a while back. You guys are facing it. Not to mention, when some home in your neighborhood gets foreclosed upon, it depreciates the value of your home. This is a horrible circle that we cannot get out of. That's a fact, right? So so the worst thing about it is when you have a $100,000 home, it becomes in disrepair, it ends up being worth $10,000, or at least that's what the bank sells it for. It's called a short sale. And then what happens is your house just overnight dropped in value, like $5,000, and you're pissed, right? And there's no way to really fix this. So we said, Chris, we're going to actually get this going. So we started the Hardship Home Foundation up a few months ago. One of the first things we really focused on was more Oklahoma. And then uh, one thing led to another. We found out how to go to banks and have the banks donate these properties to us. So once they donate these properties to us, they get 100% tax write-off. Otherwise, they'd only be able to write off the disparity in the money that they sold it for. And then once they donate it to us, we put 10000 whatever we need to, to flip the home. And then we sell it back in the community to a veteran, to a domestically battered woman, to somebody that deserves a chance in life. And I can tell you why. People like Major Sweezy over there, 100% financing we can get him. And we can pay his closing costs, and we can, refix, or we can remodel his home for him. He doesn't pay a damn dime. That's how you fix the American neighborhoods, okay? And you know how much it cost all of you guys as taxpayers? Zero dollars. You actually made money off this as taxpayers because the federal government's not holding your assets up anymore. I promise you that. That is social enterprise. Well, people are like, well, that's good. Anybody can put up a website. This small print that you guys can't see right here, this list is just the, the projects we've done under the, the price point of $100,000. And then next to it are the, the 100000 to 250000 and then $250,000 up. This is four pages long, and that's all I could fit on this PowerPoint. So tell me that we're not doing something here. I dare you. All right? That's how we're going to fix housing. So a lot of times people come to me, and they've got something highly controversial. Uh, I've had porn stars come to me. Not that I mean, people do what they want to do, and they're like, can you make me look like a nun? I'm like, it's going to take me a long time to make that happen, but I'm going to teach you how you can be more nun-like if you want. So this guy came to me, and it, I'm under the firm belief that it's not even cool being number one in the industry anymore that you're in. Anybody can do that. I got a 19-year-old friend of mine who's number one in his industry. What's cool to me is changing your industry forever. Because when you change your industry forever, when you leave your lasting thumbprint on whatever uh, career path that you have, that's when the next generation takes notice, okay? And the next generation is why we're all here today. It's not even for us, guys. We die, okay? We're hoping that they come and live longer lives. So this guy came to me, and he says, you know what, Chris? I'm a fairly attractive guy, and I'm a pickup artist, right? A pickup artist. Anybody know what that is? They teach guys how to have more game with women. I thought it was ridiculous, right? And I thought to myself, you know, I've always been a fast-talking Sicilian kid. I've always been a bit portly. But being Sicilian, you know, the ladies dig it a little bit. So I've never really had a problem. You see, when you grow up as a fat kid, it's just like when blind people can hear better, deaf people can see better, fat kids can talk better. Proven fact. Okay, there's no question. You have no option. You have to be able to talk, otherwise you're not going to shine in a crowd. So he came to me and he's like, you know what, man? I've got a logo. I'm like, cool. And the logo, as you can see, dating, sex, and pickup. Right? So I'm like, listen, I'm going to listen to you just for the simple fact I'm going to figure out how to destroy your brand and then rebuild it into something that's positive. And he said, you know what? I'm on board. I'm like, tell me some of the things you do. Oh, I do these events. Fifty Shades of Seduction. Understanding, seducing, and pleasuring men. Weird, right? So I didn't know what to think about this. But I knew that he had tons and tons of people come to his events. And he said, Chris, I care about charity, though, too. I give almost all my money to this Charity for Life program. And I said, there's a huge disparity in what you do and what you're actually doing with it. Right? You know, it's cool, man. But let's, let's try to fix this and make it make sense for your brand. So I, I challenged him. I said, this is what I'm going to do. You turn 30 years old coming up. That's a big day, right? So I said, I am going to sponsor your birthday party. Okay, name any big PR firm in Chicago that's going to sponsor a birthday party. I'm going to sponsor your birthday party. And what I want you to prove to me is that you can raise money for a charity at your event for your birthday. When you want to be out there drinking with all your buddies and all that stuff, he's like, you know what, I take that challenge. I really do. So the Spencer Burnett 30th birthday party by Christopher Fultz Collaborative, L3C, sponsored by all sorts of drinks and whatever the situation may be. Tons and tons of people, tons and tons of people. He prevents, that's him having a good time. Um, and then I realized this guy's the real deal. But his message is just a little off. And I thought to myself, what is it that makes people good at sex, dating, and pickup? It's confidence, right? Confidence is the king to everything.
Okay? You, the same confidence that makes you good with ladies or men makes you good in the boardroom. It's just a fact. Okay? So I said, how do we actually help people with your program where I don't feel like I'm going to hell? every single day. Because I want a percentage of this when it works, right? And you know, my mom would be, God rest her soul, she would be killing me if she knew that I didn't try to make this better. So I sat down with them and I said, first and foremost, man, we need to start working with people that have lack of confidence. I have a friend of mine, Sifu Carl Romain in New York market. He is Dr. Oz's Tai Chi instructor. And uh, he wrote a book all about how young kids should go to the martial arts to build that confidence up when you're younger. I've got all sorts of people like this that I can pair together. But first and foremost, we have to change your brand, okay? So what I did is he was spending all of his time making all of his money doing private one-on-one -on -one consulting. And I said, the more you do one-on-one -on -one consulting, the, the less money and less time we're going to be able to, to spend actually doing these charity cases for people that really need your services. So I built him a membership site, did it myself, um, where now he has a program for 37 bucks, the famous seven in the success coaching industry or whatever, right? Um, and, uh, and basically he sells 12 program guides for people to come in here for 37 bucks that basically teach you all like the risque stuff, just so we can stop talking about it. If you want to learn about sex and pickup, buy a shit for 37 bucks. Okay, we're done with that. All right, so then I said, what we're going to do is we're going to spend all of our time helping kids with Asperger's disease and autism and any of the people that are scared to death to talk to people. Not scared to get in the bed with somebody, but scared to death to talk. Because that's where confidence is needed. No question about it. So I said, in order to do that, Spencer, we're switching who you are. Social interaction expert. No more sex, no more pickup, no more dating. Relationships start from the moment you talk to somebody. That's it. Sometimes they start the moment you look at them. And all relationships don't need to end in sex. We know this, guys. Relationships are things that even when I was a waiter, I formed a relationship with every single person I served something to. That's how it goes. That's why I was fired. But regardless of the, regardless of the situation, it is what it is. So then, we sat there and we figured out how we were going to do this. So I partnered him up with the old Playboy uh, advice columnist for Playboy magazine. I partnered him up with a female model uh, who's naturally endowed and was beaten up for this when she was a young girl, beaten up for having large natural breasts as an Italian girl when she was younger. Who beats up somebody for that? All of these people took a stand and took whatever it was in their life that they lacked because when I finally understood who Spencer Burnett was, he told me that when he was a young kid, he had zero confidence. Zero confidence. And this is how he was able to build his own thing. So I partnered them all together and I promise you right now, you're going to see this kid on television upcoming for a TV show that he's casted in where he's doing exactly what I told you he is. Teaching confidence for people that need it the most. Not to get laid. Alright? That's social enterprise. And all the money that's made from that is going to fund scholarship programs for people that don't have a dime. Because that's how we make the world better. Even when you don't believe something at the beginning, don't run from it. Make it better. See how simple that is to make something better? Three words is all it took to change this guy's brand. One thing that I want to talk about more than anything is the organization that is near and dear to my heart, a safe haven, the one that Nelly is the president and founder of. So <clears throat> it's one thing to do things for your brand that don't necessarily make sense. But I was homeless. I was a drug addict. I lost everything in my life. And it was organizations like a safe haven that got me back on my feet. Now a safe haven is by far the best program in America for people that are, are starting their life over. And how do I know this is because other states in America come visit a safe haven. The governor of Indiana was just there the other day because they were so impressed. More importantly, somebody from the higher levels of the Chinese political administration came here and says, by far, of all the places he visited in America, this place at Roosevelt in California, just a block away from the 13th most dangerous neighborhood in America, has really set the stage. So I had to figure out how I got involved with this. And how I first got involved was I took Miss Illinois and had her do a Christmas clothing drive, and we donated all the stuff to a safe haven. Now, when you ever go to something that deals with homeless people, you think you're going up to a halfway house or a three flat with a bunch of drug addicts in it. This place is like a college campus at Roosevelt in California. For those of you guys who have not been there, the boss is right over there. And I'll make sure that she gives you guys a tour because this place is changing lives daily. But you see, it's one thing to take somebody in and clean them, get them on, uh, uh, off the streets, get their lives back in order. But it's another thing to get them educated, get them back to the employment. You know what? The true American dream is not being an employee. The true American dream is being an employer. So you can create the American dream for the next generation. That's what we do at a safe haven. We create that. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about the run real quick. So last year, 
Nellie came to me. It was 62 days before the run to end homelessness. This is their second year doing it. A first year, what did it raise Nellie? Like $40,000, $60,000, something like that. Now, this event, most of the runs are always in cliche places. Soldier Field, down Lakeshore Drive. Nellie said, you know what? Across the street from us, Douglas Park, as I brought up earlier. This is one of the worst crime-riddled neighborhoods in America. So we're going to have all these aristocratic people that run for fun. Did you guys know running for fun is an actual thing? I had no clue, right? So last year, I did about 0.5K, then I dipped in the bushes and did the last 0.5K. But either way, I started and I finished. So you guys can't say anything about that. This year, I plan on doing 0.6K, so let's just take it slow. So she came to me and she said, listen, uh, now this lady has more aspirations. I mean, she has the biggest goals I've ever met. You know, she's like, you know, we made $50,000 last year. We want to make $8 million this year. That's the type of lady she is, to raise money for this. And you know what? I respect her even more for it because it's tough right now in America. The federal government puts restrictions on how much money we can donate. How ridiculous is that, right? So we sat there and we're like, how do we do this? Now again, I go back to my roots of being fired from restaurants and everybody in their life wants to sit at the cool kids table at lunch. Everybody does. Dr. Wolf's still trying to get at the cool kids table and he's, you know, he's in the middle of his life. I'll just be honest with you. So what I did is I said, you know what? I'm going to throw an event and I'm going to throw an event at the most expensive place in the city of Chicago and I'm not paying a dime to do this event. And I'm going to raise all the money to put it towards my run and homelessness team. For a moment, I will look like the most athletic person in Chicago if my run team has the most money. So that's what I was really going for. So what I did is my dear friend Chelsea Autumn here, a client of mine, I'm a publicist by trade, um, she, she had a television show called Millionaire Matchmaker on Bravo. You guys have all seen it. Her and Patty Stanger basically take rich guys and make them have less money, and <clears throat> so, which they probably deserve. So anyways, Chelsea was in town for a wedding. I said, you know what? We're going to throw an event at the Witt Hotel. Brand new hotel, glass rooftop in the ceiling in Chicago, eight grand a night to rent this place. And I said, not only am I not paying for it, you guys are giving us stuff to do this event too. So I put all the cool kids in town. The coolest one is Nellie right there, the guy in charge of models, my dear friend and colleague Lisa Lockwood, Miss Illinois, the love advice columnist for Playboy, Vince Vaughn's mom, Cesar Roland from Latino Fashion Week, and the inventor of house music. Now, when you put all those people on a piece of paper, people look at it, right? This event had so many people in it. The whole wet rooftop was packed. We raised thousands of dollars. There's me. How adorable. And then, of course, that's uh, uh, Chelsea Autumn. And not only did this mo uh, event raise money, then we scaled it. We started talking about it on Facebook. Okay? And mind you, the event, forty dollars to $60,000 the first year. Nellie really turned it up with everybody in the organization the second year. Then we put it on our website, joined Chris Foltz as the Foltz Effect team, um, you know, which was, I thought, really cool when people joined my team. I had all the cool media personalities. Um, and then we realized there was 2,000 people there. Okay? We realized that same event that just a year prior made forty to $60,000 did $150,000 of, of fundraising in one morning. Do you realize how many people's lives you can change with that much money when you didn't have it the day before? Do you realize how significant it is when you get 2,000 people to come to the 13th worst neighborhood in America? Do you realize that? And I can tell you right now, a lot of those people have never even stepped inside of the west part of Chicago ever. And I promise you that. This year, as it stands today, we are almost to the point of doubling the fundraising we did last year, and we're almost to the point of making this the biggest event in Chicago, period, in Douglas Park, the park that people forgot. That is social impact. And that lady right over there is the one that makes me cry every morning when I think about it. And I promise you, in nonprofits and charities, you have to be smart, okay? Because it has to get bigger every year, because rules get more vast. So we have to beat it. The economy gets worse. That means we need to have more money in the private sector because you know the federal government isn't doing a damn thing. So what we had to do is when you do things for the right reasons, they don't end for the wrong reasons. And that's why this organization keeps growing. And so here's actually the people that were on my team, some of them, that's all of our shoes. If you guys remember from my intro video, it's Together We Can Change the World. We took all of our feet and made this photo. This is this year's graphic. Um, and I can tell you right now that we have one of the largest purses for a world and United States record for a 5K ever in the existence of mankind happening at that. Why? Because two companies that aren't even from Chicago decided that they were going to fly in and put that money up because they wanted to prove that the model here in Chicago got to them all the way in Maine and got to them all the way in California. And you know what the biggest challenges are, period, when it comes down to losing everything and being homeless? Is you don't have an ID. You don't have a birth certificate. You don't have family members to support you. So when you don't have an identification, it's like being off the face of the earth. So Nellie came up with this amazing concept with the people at Mozito. Uh, and these people are going to get 
basically almost like a credit card. It is a credit card, a MasterCard logo on it. Your face, your name, your identification, no bank account. So when you get your first job, you have a place to get money. You don't have to worry about check cashing policies because it's all right there. And when you graduate a safe haven, every person gets $100 in that account just to start their life off. Now, I, you tell me one organization in America that after you leave, still sticks with you until you get your first job. And then the greatest thing about it is, then they created all their own companies. They train people in things like culinary arts, and they give them a job in the catering company they have, pest control. Nellie has her own nail polish B products, which is a social business enterprise that was in the Grammys gift bags. Do you know how hard it is to do in the Grammys gift bags? You have the number one selling tooth whitening products in America. How often have you ever been in a Grammy gift bag? The lady right back there has been in it twice. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. We'll work on it next year. That's how you do things. And then all the people came out. We got bold to end homelessness. And then this is this year's. Look at how many sponsors we have. I mean, ABC carries it live. Canon. I mean, these are major players. And this year we have a huge concert for free right here. The Shy Lights. Who likes the Shy Lights? Yeah, yeah right? See, I knew you ladies over here would love it. So Marshall Thompson's out there. Georgie Porgy. Uh, Rhyme Fest. How many of y'all heard the song Jesus Walks by Kanye? Okay? Yeah, thank you right there. He's the one who wrote it. And you know what he's doing this year? He's writing a theme song for this run, and it's the residents inside of a safe haven that are actually going to be on this track from a Grammy Award winning musician. And all of this is free for the people in the community because they deserve it. And we do it all for one reason. We do it for these kids. Okay? These are the ones that live in the Roosevelt campus of a safe haven. And I promise you this, guys. I plan on running for governor in 2018 of Illinois. I plan on being alderman in the next election. Thank you. <laughs> Let's wait till I get elected. Thank you very much. But I can tell you right now what would be the greatest honor of my life if I ran for governor and one of those kids ran against me and they won. Because that's how you know that we changed the world. Okay? Because they were homeless just about a few months. Some of them are even born into homelessness. So that's how you do things. One thing that's very important is the exposure stage, right? So it's great to have all these media sponsors. It's great to know a bunch about, you know, uh, how we get press releases out. But if the media doesn't listen, if you don't have a story, most people try to put everything out. I have this one client of mine, world famous attorney. He wants me to put out a press release every time he goes to the bathroom. I kid you not, right? He went to a Justin Bieber concert once, like a 65 year old man. Awkward from day one. And he wanted me to put a press release out. And it took me three hours to convince him that if I put that press release out, it would have a negative effect on his career. And uh, well, we finally won that battle. But then how I realized you deal with media is very simple. <laughs> you have to find a way to show the media that they need and want you as an individual, as a brand. Because if you're carrying messages of good worth, then they deserve to hear them. This guy right here, Jeff Pincus, right? 560 is like the Chicago conservative radio station. For those of you guys who are conservative, A, I'm sorry. B, this is the station you would listen to. Now, Jeff Pincus came to me, right? Now, he's what they would call portly. And he said, you know what, Chris? I want to create a man diet. I'm like, all right, man. So if you want to create a man diet, Jeff, you've got to give me something because, quite frankly, you're fat. And I'm not sure that people in America are going to buy this. Now, I'm a bigger guy, too, so I'd be more inclined to buy it from you just because it's like the good old boy system. But this has to work, right? There are laws. So he says, don't worry, Chris. I've got it all figured out. The Jeff Pincus Man Diet Center. <laughs> and that was his logo that he came up with. Now, first of all, it looks like somebody that's going to come in and, 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 and just James Bond snipe the fat off of you or whatever. And I said, you realize that's not a number. And you realize that it's example.com. He's like, oh, this is the first draft. I said, Jeff, listen, I will help you under one condition. You put anything I want that's social enterprise on your radio station. Now he's on daytime drive time for a much larger station than 560, and he still owes me this every single time. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make your man diet cool. So we came up with the Jeff Pincus man diet. Now that's bacon, and that's a mustache. Now there are two things that are hot right now in America, mustaches, and bacon. Now, I think bacon's always been hot. I tried buying the website kosherbacon.com, and believe it or not, somebody has that. Um, so I figured that I'm going to put bacon on his, uh, on his logo. Right here's actual dog tags. My dogs have these dog tags on. And I'm happy to say that this guy's man diet center is in like 35 physical therapy centers. Um, you can get involved with this program. I actually got weighed on national uh, radio, and I was heavy. And, you know, I start going through this process and I'm seeing these really fat guys for the first time in their life being comfortable. 
because they're amongst themselves. And they're losing weight, I think, halfway through camaraderie, halfway that they just talk so much when they're together and just burn it all off. I'm not sure what it is. But now Jeff Pincus owes me. And the greatest thing is, is you never forget where you came from. And I put Jeff Pincus in the Healthy Initiative in Chicago, which actually helped his brand grow even more. So now this media personality owes me. Well, I've got half the media personalities in Chicago that are on my client roster. So I think that's a fairly good position. Then I started picking up New York. Then I started picking up Los Angeles. Now I basically represent anybody that matters. And to me, what matters is people that do the one thing, and that's change the world. So we're almost done here. When that's not enough, you become the media yourself. Now, I'll be honest, I am not the world's most attractive guy. But for some reason, they put me on television and radio all the time. I'm honored to be an analyst for ABC News. I'm honored to be on the Man Cow Show. Uh, when I'm not, I've been, I'm the person that's been kicked off the Man Cow Show more than anyone in America. All right, <laughs> Eric Man Cow Muller and I are boys and everything, but I get kicked off every single time because he wants to talk about whatever tantrums he's going on. But quite frankly, that's how easy you can get things done because when you're on the media, you don't have to worry about anything because you can say it all. And then a casting director came to my Myself, came to Lisa Lockwood, came to a team of people, were casted for a television show that's coming out about changing people's lives, like on Shark Tank. You go on the Shark Tank show, they invest in you, we decide to take you on as a client, and we decide to change your lives. So now I am the media. So when you guys are in my camp and you have something really important that you want to get done, you come to me, and I promise you I'll be in your corner. As long as you care about society, as long as you have a mission to it, I'm the guy for you. Now one thing I can say is this. In life you have to take giant leaps. Who here knows about Camden, New Jersey? Anybody? So, my friend, uh, uh, my friend Cory Booker is running for U.S. Senate right now uh, in Camden, New, or in uh, New Jersey, as a state. And uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gave a hundred million dollars to the Newark, New Jersey school district because he believed in Cory Booker. And, and Cory Booker is the type of guy. Anybody ever heard of Cory Booker? We just had him back here in Illinois. Cory Booker had an interview one day on the news, and the news reporter brought him out there, and they brought the candidate that was against him out there, and they asked one question. Describe what you see. So the first candidate came up, you know, well, that's a very bad school, that's a drug-infested park, that's a retail outlet that was closed down, and Cory Booker got up there and he said, that's an award-winning school, that's a park my kids are going to play in, and that's the new retail shopping center we're building in downtown Newark, New Jersey, because he saw what could be. Right? So many times in our life we have blinders on, but I promise you guys, we're all broken in one way or the other. The faster that we realize this, the faster we can fix each other. Right? We are all broken in America. So. I found out that Camden, New Jersey has the worst crime rate in America. One in every thousand people get murdered there every year. Now, if you guys really think about that, that's ridiculous. Every 33 hours, somebody gets shot. Every 33 hours. That means in the time that you go through a normal course of the day and wake up the next day, somebody has been shot in Camden, New Jersey. And, and Camden is a very important part. This they used to be one of the communities that had the beautiful sign that we all see. And they used to be one of the communities that had a Main Street district. And then they used to be one of the communities that actually got attention. And then this is that same street now. That same one that you just saw. And then, and then it gets worse. The foreclosure rates are tremendous. And, and, and the kids have nowhere to go because schools are closed. And, and there's graffiti everywhere. The police, that's a police chief, the police department is outnumbered at every corner block in Camden, New Jersey. It's absolutely bad. Now, we think Chicago's bad. You've not seen anything until you've seen Camden, New Jersey. So the moment I found out about this, I was on the phone with the mayor of Camden, New Jersey. I'm like, how can I help? How can I help you get this done? I've got health care. I've got sustainable housing models that I can bring in there. I've got awesome ladies like this that we know will help out. I've got dentists. What do we need to fix this? And they said, Chris, listen, we are, first of all, so baffled that you even care. And it took me a while. Just like when I joined the Democratic Party, it took me a while to gain the trust. Because everybody that goes to Camden, New Jersey, wants to just draw attention to the negatives. You see, I didn't even see the negatives. I still don't see the negatives. Because all I see is this girl trying to jump rope. Okay, and she's trying to jump rope in front of her home, and you can't even sit on her stoop while her little brother's over there wondering how he's not going to get tetanus on that rusted pole. You see, to me, that is unacceptable. And to me, that has got to change. So it's okay to take giant leaps. It's okay to call a town across the country and say, hey, listen, how can I help? And they said to me, Chris, what kind of scalable model do you have to show us? And I'm like, damn, I don't know what to do. I don't have anything specific to show you, but I can tell you right now that three months ago, you guys all know I went through drug addiction and all this stuff, and, and, and about three months ago I gave the keynote address at the public relations convention. Okay, now that was a big thing. I've never taken a PR class in my life. Matter of fact, I left to work for the president. I didn't even finish my college degree. I'm a graduate professor of business at Columbia here in Chicago, which is amazing. But I sit here, 
and I said, wow, I'm giving this keynote address, and we found out a Safe Haven's winning a trumpet award, which is paramount to the Oscar award in our industry for the stuff we did there, and I got a call from back home. And my best friend, I grew up across the street from this guy. We did everything together. We went into drug addiction together. I got out. People like a Safe Haven gave me something to look up to in life, and he didn't. And, and for the last year and a half, I haven't talked to him. I tried to get him everything, and they found him dead of a heroin overdose. Okay, now, I don't know. I mean, I've lost my mom. I've lost my grandma. I know what it is like. But when you lose a best friend that you could do nothing to stop, it takes you apart. So I got that call, all the top of everything, and I walked out to the floor where all my employees are, beautiful 5,000 square foot office in Chicago, and I said, we are moving to the west side of Chicago. Because I remember that when I couldn't get drugs in Rockford, I would get in my car and drive to the west side of Chicago to get it. And, and I said, you know what? And we're moving in two weeks. And I'm moving my condo. And people think that I'm crazy. We were in this beautiful office building. I had the most badass office you could have. Great conference rooms, all this stuff, all the private jets and all that stuff that there is in the world. But the truth of the matter, I wasn't satisfied at all. So people in my office started putting in their two weeks notice. They think they're going to get shot on the west side of Chicago. Just made me fight more. OK, they listen to too much Lupe Fiasco is what it is. So. I ripped down my sign in my office, did one last webcam and one live uh, radio appearance for my office, uh, emptied it all out, packed up U-Hauls over the course of the night because there are rules moving out of buildings. We moved over to the west side of Chicago to right down the street from a safe haven foundation into an abandoned office, okay, with nothing but cement on the grounds, um, with, with whatever that is that was going down the stairwell. And we sat up. We had any internet, we had no phones, we just got our floors put in the other day. Dr. Wolf was there when we had plywood on the ground. And I said, you know what? I'm running for all the men of Chicago and I'm gonna to go to the area that nobody would expect somebody like me coming in to change. And that's the 28th Ward of Chicago where we need this. So, um, there we are. 13th worst community in America, and I don't give a damn. So we opened up our office and I created something called Move Chicago Forward. Now, sometimes in politics we don't get anything done, but I promise you right now, you can fake that you're mayor any day you want. Okay, so I faked that I was mayor, and how would I fix the city of Chicago? And I came up with education, housing, employment, health care, public safety, veterans issues, social enterprise, and environment. I'm gonna crowdfund our way to fixing the government in America. Why? Because I can. And that's when you should do things in the world, not because you get paid, but because you you can. That's what makes us better people. And it started this week, and I'm so damn excited about it, and that's how we change the world. We work collaboratively. That's what Bernie Dorman was talking about last year when he said collaborative capitalism. See, it wasn't so much about the money. It was about the result. I'm in the business of getting things done. So you can sit up here, or I can stand up here and talk about social impact, or we can all walk out that door and actually make one. That's how you get things done in this country. I'm going to close on this final story. I live in a very nice residential building downtown Chicago, which I just kind of fell into. I don't live there now because I live on the west side of Chicago because I moved my condo as well because you've got to practice what you preach, right? So I remember when I was living in my hoity-toity residential building. Now, I'm what they would call a hoarder, okay? <laughs> so any, anything, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I'll empty my pockets right now. You'll see gum wrapper. I mean, it's ridiculous. You guys think I'm like 250 pounds? I'm like a buck 85. I just got tons of stuff in my pocket, right? <laughs> just being honest. So... I was coming downstairs in my residential building and I saw this guitar in the dumpster, literally in the dumpster. So I'm like, damn, I'm taking that for sure. That's the nicest bit of trash I found this week. Because uh, I'd already had other things. Half my furniture, my girlfriend loves this. Half my furniture at home is from some sort of trash. But then she got that Pinterest thing. So I promise you, it's all good. They encourage you to get trash in Pinterest, right? So I had an idea. I see this guitar downstairs, and, I, and it's not very hard to realize that if you have an idea and you have a motivation, right? And then once you have that motivation, you decide that you actually care about giving back in society, which I do. If that equals something very simple. That is what social impact is. So I took this guitar, this gross guitar. I had my assistant polish it up because I was just too scared and I just never would have. And then I started having celebrities sign it. Celebrities from all over the country. Fashion designers, television personalities, anybody that I could get my hands on that cared. And I promise you, this guitar is going to get auctioned off to charity and I expect to bring no less than $10,000 in from a piece of trash. That reminded me of my life because no matter who we are in life, We've all been in the dumpster one day. It's up to you whether you get out of there. It's up to you to walk over to people like Nellie Vasquez Roland and figure out how you can help at a safe haven. It's up to you to go over there to Bill Walsh and figure out how he can help you get your brand to the next level. Let's not be in any kind of lie. 
I want your tax dollars. I want you guys to make more money in business. Why? So I can fix the America with it. Because that's what it is. This is America. We all live here together. So that's what I'm talking about with social impact. So if somebody can hit the lights um, and lower this real quick. This is my final thing. So I don't know how many of you guys know who Craig Newmark is. A uh, buddy of mine, he owns a company called Craigslist. You guys have all been there, seen it all, right? Um, you know, I didn't know if that was just a nerd thing or if that was mainstream enough for everybody in the room. And he said to me, he's like, Chris, listen, I believe in social enterprise. And I believe that you need to really sit down and find people that actually matter to you. People that you want to look up to. And for somebody like me, I want to look up to everybody. My heroes are people like you in this room. See, it's not the heroes like the Richard Bransons of the world. It's the people like you that don't have everything they do that make something from it. So Apple wanted to come out with this commercial years ago. And they wanted to show the world that just by simply putting people together that we understood their stories and kind of telling it from a different direction that we'd be able to get a response from the audience. Now the problem is Apple never played the commercial and I got my hands on it, made a couple modifications, we got volume on and guys I'll tell you this, you have the opportunity to walk out that door right now and do two things. You can walk to your car and leave like everybody wants to after a long day or you can sit around and talk to Mark Papadis, talk to Nelly, talk to Bill and find out how you can make a difference because these people you're about to see on this video see they made a difference and I promise you right now I really don't work with clients very often when you work with me I partner up with you and we make an initiative together if you have five thousand dollars you now have ten because I put five thousand dollars into it you want me on your website fine you're gonna be on my website we will build an initiative together I will build your move Chicago forward why not because uh, uh, of, of some reasons for money, not because somebody doesn't have a version of Move Chicago Ford, but because I can, and you guys can too. So I close with this, pay attention. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. That's how you guys change the world. God bless you all for being here today. All right? I appreciate you all. Thank you very much. No need to stand. Best thing you can do is prove that you can do this too. Thank you. Thank you.